It seems a critical retrospective made a video about me. I wonder how long this took to make. Fly away, my little Akuma. Let's give this a watch with his fans. Hello everyone and welcome back to A Critical Retrospective. This is my first Miraculous Ladybug video essay in over two months. Sorry to keep you waiting for so long, I've missed talking about this show. And no matter how bad it gets, I just won't stop talking about it because it's so much fun. So many inconsistencies, plot holes, and frankly baffling story decisions that just leave you wondering what the heck happened in the writer's room. And there is no character who perfectly exemplifies all of these flaws more than the show's main villain, Gabriel Agrest. The guys are confusing mess of disparate toads and personalities. I mean, could you imagine season 1 Gabriel acting even remotely like season 5 Gabriel? What even is this? What am I watching right now? Anyway, the point is, I'd like to go quite into depth about why Gabriel is such a terrible antagonist, and whether or not there really is a villain worth saving underneath all of this mediocre writing. And there are some good aspects to his character, mostly in seasons 2 and 4. So without further ado, let's get started. Ah, I remember back in the days of season 1 being the only season and everyone wondering and theorising as to Hawkmoth's true identity. Gabriel Grest, Hawkmoth, the same person. Hawkmoth is Adrian's dad, aka Gabriel Grest. A lot of people are saying that, well, Gabriel Grest, this man, this man just got akumatized. How is he Hawkmoth? Mr. Agrest is not Hawkmoth. Mr. Agrest is not Hawkmoth. Hawkmoth Hawk Moth is not Mr. Agrest. Oh my god, I can't even speak because, guys, I was wrong. We were all wrong. I'm getting so much nostalgia for those days. I used to watch so many theory channels about the show back when there was only one season and everyone wanted to know when season two was coming out and what the collector and style queen were going to get up to. Cards on the table here. The season one section of this video is going to be less of an analysis and more of a nostalgia trip for me. And that's because there's very little to talk about in terms of Gabriel's character in season one. We didn't even know he and Hawkmoth were the same person until season two. Hawkmoth and Gabriel Agrest are separate characters in season one as far as I I'm concerned, and they're both very simple without each other to complement one another. Gabriel's just a maniacal supervillain bent on ruling the world? I mean, he keeps saying that this season. It doesn't really feel like they knew what they wanted his backstory to be, so gave him a generic supervillain motivation. However, you can't deny the mystique of Hawkmoth was at its absolute peak in season 1, I say. We had absolutely no idea who he was or why he wanted Ladybug and Cat Noir's miraculouses. However, I would have preferred if they tried to make it less obvious who he was. All of the clues and signs were leading to Gabriel Agrest. I mean, seriously, this is all it took. Let us engage in the art of deduction. Hawkmoth has a picture of Gabriel's wife in the moth brooch. Both he and Gabriel have rings on their left hands. Their appearances and voices are exactly the same. Gabriel was acting really fishy in the episode Simon Says, trying to take Ladybug's Miraculous and all. I mean, at least they tried, right? But I just can't help but think this. The bad guy is a secret bad guy. It's not a very good secret. Well, at least the writers aren't trying to subvert our expectations or anything, because that never ends well for anybody. So I can respect the writers for this. Besides, two years of building up Hawkmoth and Gabriel as separate entities meant we could appreciate each one's similarities and differences without connecting the two. Gabriel being a minor character, I'd say, is way better than him being a really, really, really terribly written main character. But before we trudge into those dark waters, let's look at the peak of his character, shall we? I think season 2 is the best season for a lot of reasons, one of those being Gabriel's character arc. He's been given a lot more depth than he was in the previous season, and this was just the right time for this to be given to him. After all, things hadn't gone completely stale yet in late 2017, did they? We could still enjoy the show for what it was back in season 1, but there were little hints that there was more under the surface than met the eye. That's why theories were so prevalent those days, because there was so much to chew on. Nowadays, I feel like the things that bring in the views are just complaining about Miraculous, which is perfectly 
understandable. After all, the writing choices as of late haven't been satisfactory, have they? Season 2 gave us so many exciting revelations for a lot of different things, but one of the most important being that Gabriel is Hawkmoth. This was so exciting because it validated the fandom's ideas and fan theories. Learning that you were right all along is way more cathartic than seeing something unexpected, and the writers knew exactly how to leverage the surprise with the satisfaction of knowing we were correct. Besides, Gabriel being Hawkmoth opens up so many opportunities for the story to go in so many different ways. Now that the Gabriel Hawkmoth reveal has broken the ice, we can theorise and learn about why Gabriel wants the Miraculouses so badly and what his motivations are. It was fascinating to think about where Gabriel's character would be headed from here. Whether or not combining the two characters into the same entity would humanise Hawkmoth or make Gabriel even more despicable. And we all know which route they chose. They decided to give him some flavours of sympathy for the audience. As it turns out, the whole reason Gabriel was doing any of this was so he could combine Ladybug and Cat Noir's Miraculouses to make a wish. A wish to resurrect his wife so that he and Adrian could have a happy family again. And this? This is a heartbreaking backstory. Gabriel is someone so tortured by the loss of someone so important to him that he was willing to do anything to make things better. Look at this scene at the start of Queen Wasp when he thinks all hope is lost and he gives up being Hawkmoth. He just sits down, holding back so much, so much emotion, so many years of grief that he never tended to, feeling completely hopeless and downtrodden, wondering, where do I go from here? It's a really small scene, but it's so meaningful, and I'd go as far as to say it's one of the best scenes in the whole show. Seeing somebody who's caused so much harm on the regular, acting like a completely dastardly supervillain on the regular, to see the mask literally and figuratively fall off as we see Gabriel for the tortured man inside that he really is, is quite powerful. He's finally becoming a character worthy of being the main villain, giving himself more than just one dimension to his character. But wait, I hear you asking, if Gabriel is just a tortured man, then why does he act so crazy as Hawkmoth? Why does he seem like he genuinely enjoys being evil? <laughs> Well, if I'm being perfectly honest, that is a good point. <laughs> but I bet I could explain it if you just give me a chance, right? Maybe Gabriel puts on a big evil supervillain front to make him forget why he's really doing this for a bit. Maybe Emily's memory is too painful for him to bear because it just reminds him that she's no longer with him. Maybe, just maybe, Hawkmoth is a representation of Gabriel's denial. His stubbornness keeping him from ever giving up on his goal but never wanting to truly remember it. The thing about trying to find something is the fact that you have to acknowledge that you lost it in the first place. Maybe Gabriel kept saying he was going to rule the world in season 1 so that he didn't have to think about Emily's dead frozen corpse in the basement. He doesn't have to think about why he's really doing this because it's just too much to bear. This pursuit is causing him to sacrifice the lives of so many people that he actually does care for. So, if he just pretends he's trying to destroy the world, a very simple goal, he doesn't have to think about all the carnage he's leaving in his wake because evil supervillains don't have people they care about, right? All they care about are themselves and their goals and their ambitions, so if Gabriel plays the part of one, he doesn't have to think about the people he actually does care about. For half an episode, he can pretend that he doesn't need anybody else. He's in denial because he's grieving, and he won't let himself get to the point where he can accept the loss. Because doing so would admit that he's given up, and he can't give up yet because soon everything will work out, right? This is what I mean when I say that Gabriel's character arc really took a turn in season 2 for the better. I wouldn't have been able to speculate that much if they didn't give me so much food for thought in season 2. And I think this is a pretty good justification for the contrasting personalities between Gabriel and Hawkmoth that adds more complexity to his character. Wouldn't you agree? HOLD IT! Yes, I'll concede that none of this actually has any concrete proof and I'm just saying stuff. I'm not sure whether or not the writers actually wanted us to think about these things or if I'm just you know, making stuff up. But that's the thing, isn't it? Shouldn't fans of a show have the ability to think beyond the writer's perspective and come up with their own ideas? After all, we can't expect the writers to think of everything, can we? Sometimes it's nice to leave some questions unanswered so that fan engagement will remain high. If you tell everyone everything there is to know about a story, then there's no more room for interpretation. And then it's not fun anymore, is it? You're just sitting there waiting for things to blindly, passively get absorbed into your cranium. Because how much depth can a character character really have if the writers are expected to spell everything out. It's kind of an artificial way of creating depth because you're not exactly uncovering it for yourself, at least that's how I see it. But I understand that some people might disagree with me on this and that's okay. After all we don't- Oh my god what is it now?
You know, I was just getting to that if you didn't interrupt me. The episode Gorizilla is a very key episode when examining Gabriel's character and the humanity that he possesses. In this episode, Adrian runs away because he wants to see a movie that his mother took part in. Gabriel akumatizes his bodyguard into Gorizilla so he can find Adrian and bring him home. This already hints to the fact that Gabriel genuinely cares about his son and his safety. He didn't use this akumatized villain to find and take Lynch Book and Cat Noir's miraculouses, but to find Adrian and bring him home. And then we get to the very famous scene in this episode that everybody talked about back when it came out. Adrian starts falling from a building and Gabriel freaks out. We can genuinely see that Hawkmoth is actually very worried about his son's safety and wants him to return. This might have been the first indicator as far as I can remember that Gabriel genuinely cares about his son. It's really heartbreaking to see him get so frantic and obsessed over his son's safety like this considering the fact that he endangers so many people on the regular. This was before we realised exactly why Hawkmoth was Hawkmoth and why he was doing the things he was doing but it was a nice hint in the right direction. And now that all the pieces have slotted into place we finally get a villain worth caring about. He's no longer a cartoonishly evil supervillain, he's actually a human being with emotions and trials. And now he's been shown to genuinely care about his family which wasn't obvious before Gorizilla. You know I've heard some fan speculation that season 2 was written by a different person and then Asterix swooped in during season 3 to make all these dumb changes. I haven't actually checked this but I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was the truth and it would explain things like Chloe's failed redemption arc and why Gabriel went from this to this in one season. But the horrible portrayal of season 3 Gabriel is something we'll get to in a bit. Adrian, I have a great collection I want to show you. That is true. I cannot explain why Gabriel went out of his way to attack Adrian as the Collector in episode 1 of season 2. I guess I was giving the writers way too much credit, as no matter how high they fly, they will always fall just as far. Come on guys, I was rooting for you, I was defending your writing decisions, and then you just had to make something inconsistent. And speaking of inconsistent, I think it's time we talk about Gabriel in season 3, because this is where the problems really started to show themselves. Yeah, in case it wasn't immediately obvious, Gabriel's character is really bad in season 3, I'm just gonna come out and say it. And it comes down to the point that he's become really stale by this season. But wait, you may be asking, what about Mayura? I mean, surely that would add some dynamics to the villain team, given there's a new villain running amok? <laughs> Pun intended. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint, but the answer would be... No. Mayura barely does anything in season 3, and so there's barely any time for her and Hawkmoth to be developed beyond, I don't know, Hawkmoth catching her when she falls or something. And that's also something that's a little bit inconsistent with Gabriel. Why is he being so romantic with Natalie? I mean, look at this shot. There is no other way you can interpret it. From the very first day, I knew that I'd do anything for you. Does she really need to use such explicitly romantic language? Like, is anybody going to get excited by that? I mean, Gabriel is married to Emily, so what's going on here? Actually, now that I think about it, this too. What's going on here? It seems like Gabe has fallen off the path. I mean, if Emily ever wakes up, she's going to be really upset. This too. Does this man know no fear? <laughs> Okay, okay, I get it. You know, you're getting really annoying and I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels that way, so you better promise to shut up from now on. <laughs> Okay, now that we're back on track. The most inconsistent thing with regards to Gabriel this season are his relationships with Adrian, Chloe, and Lila. Let's start with Lila, shall we? In the episode Chameleon, Hawkmoth learns that Lila's actually on his side. He even says that he remembers her from Heroes Day in Volpina. He knows her name, and at the end of the episode, makes it very clear that he plans to use Lila for his plans in the future. That sounds pretty intriguing, doesn't it? Lila slowly working her way up the ranks of evil as she gets cozy with Hawkmoth. What was that young girl doing? in my house. A uh, young girl? That's Lila! You know, the girl who seven episodes ago you were literally praising for her evil machinations and willingness to help you with your goals. Is that ringing any bells for you, Gabriel? Maybe you shouldn't be so eager to send an akumatized villain to kill one of your most dependent allies. Just a thought. I shouldn't chase that girl away. She could make a very good ally. Yeah. No kidding, Gabriel. It's not like you already learned this lesson in the first episode of season 3. Where did your memory go? <sighs> I guess Gabriel just doesn't see any worth in Lila as an ally. But you know who he does see worth in? 
It's a good question. There's no end to the chicanery, is there? Yes, the whole season's plot with Hawkmoth is the fact that he wants Chloe at his side. And why, you ask? I... I don't know. They never explain it, do they? Maybe it's because Chloe's so useful with causing akumatizations, but you already have Lila for that, don't you? Is it really worth jumping through so many hoops just for Chloe? She's historically not been the most reliable ally, and she's stupid as all heck. There's very little that she'll end up accomplishing for you. So don't even bother, just focus more of your efforts on Mayura and Lila, who will actually help you out in a meaningful way. Somebody has got their priorities severely misplaced. It's like you don't really care about the most important things things in life, do you, Hawkmoth? Which, speaking of, Cat Blanc was the point of no return for Gabriel's sympathetic character. There was none in this episode. He psychologically torments his own son in order to akumatize him to get Ladybug's miraculous so he can bring his wife back to life. Never mind the fact that Gabriel's only doing this so that Adrian will be happy with his mother and so that Gabriel won't suffer the heartbreak of the loss anymore. Just ignore the fact that Gabriel seemed genuinely concerned for his son's well-being in the episode Gorizilla last season. Just toss all that out of the window right now, it didn't matter anyway. Gabriel's acting in complete opposition to everything he stood for, and it makes no sense. That's not to mention hitting Adrian for a home run, not giving two hoots about the fact that Adrian is clearly completely emotionally distressed and bankrupt from all of this stuff that's been going on around him and learning that his father is a supervillain. I feel like the general consensus for how Gabriel would react to Cat Noir's identity reveal before this episode came out would be shock and horror, but I guess he was just always waiting for the opportunity to get the Miraculouses as easy as possible, hoping Adrian would just ignore all of the abuse. This doesn't make any sense considering his previous reactions and behaviours in season 2 and 1. Care to explain why he's so different here? Is it because this is an alternative universe and so the Gabriel in our actual universe that the show is actually following wouldn't actually do stuff like this? Well, no, because he does this again in Ephemeral. So now we know Gabriel is more than willing to do evil things to his own son if it means getting his wife back. Is this the fluke or was season 2 the fluke? I'm willing to bet it was season 3 because, well, with all due respect, very little in season 3 was him. <laughs> good. If there's one thing the writers really need to do is shake things up. Get rid of Hawkmoth, he's getting really stale. I'm getting really sick of this guy, so let's move on to a fresh new villain, shall we? Oh. Well, this isn't what I was talking about, but you know what? It's different enough, so I'll give it the talk it deserves. Okay, here we are, the dawn of Shadow Moth, which astute observers of my Q&A video will probably know is my favourite iteration of Gabriel thus far. Why? Well, uh, I like his name and design. That's pretty much it. I know it's really weird to hear that I like this abomination of a design, but I don't know, it grew on me. Something interesting and really funny that I find about Shadow Moth is that Gabriel felt the need to rebrand for some reason. I mean, the fact that he's completely changed his costume and goes out of his way to change his name and activate both Miraculouses even when he's just sending an Akuma is so funny. And I hope I'm not the only one who notices this, but every season when Hawk Moth sends out an Akuma, the theme is different. And I feel like that the season 4 version is is just the best version of the theme. As I've mentioned before in this video, the scenes where Hawkmoth opens his window and sends out an Akuma are my favourite parts of every episode. So whenever somebody gets upset and then I hear that window chime with the best version of the theme song playing, I get really excited. <laughs> And I know it's a stupid thing to get excited over, but when you watch the same thing for like seven years, it tends to grow on you. But one thing I don't really understand is the name. Shadow Moth. While I do think it sounds really cool, I don't really get what that has to do with him unifying the Moth and Peacock Miraculouses. I think I read somewhere that they were going to call him Peacock Moth, but they changed their minds, which... Thanks. Good on them. That sounds so stupid. So is there anything I don't like about the Shadow Moth era of the show? Well, yes actually. It's Gabriel's incorporation of the Peacock Miraculous, or lack thereof. Honestly, he goes out of his way to fix it and then barely uses it all season. He only uses it in 12 episodes, those being Truth, Queen Banana, Gabriel Agrest, Megaleech, Guilt Trip, Optigami, Senti Bubbler, Hexan, Chilin, Ephemeral, Kuroneko, and Strike Back. And as you probably know, that's barely anything. That's less than 50% of the whole season. He's wearing the Peacock Miraculous, and yet he refuses to use it to its full potential. He'd rather just send out Akuma after Akuma after Akuma, which he's been doing for three seasons at this point. It's getting old, and I really thought that Shadow Moth would be the shakeup the show needed, and for the most part, it really was. But they really didn't take it far enough, did they? For the most part, Shadow Moth is literally just a rebranding and an aesthetic change. He doesn't really do all of that that makes him 
differentiate himself from Hawkmoth. He just feels derivative. I mean, even his design is just so close to Hawkmoth's original design. Why didn't they take it further? Maybe they ran out of time or something? Or maybe they were just that uncreative? I literally have no idea. I mean, is the weird thing on his face supposed to resemble a peacock in some way, shape or form? I don't think so. I just feel like while I like this design, Hawkmoth's design was a lot sleeker and more professional looking. It screams evil mastermind. This? Now this is just plain embarrassing. Isn't Gabriel a fashion designer in show? Why isn't he better at picking a design? Actually, I just thought of something. Something quite important, well, not really all that important, but still quite interesting. When Marina and Adrian both learn of the existence of Shadow Moth, they have absolutely no idea what he looks like. All they have to go off of is the name change, as well as the fact that he's merged the Peacock and Butterfly Miraculouses together. That's literally all they know about him. And so, I wonder what they were thinking he was going to look like, and I wonder if their expectations really match the reality of what he really does look like. They only first saw him in first person in the episode Sentibubbler, midway through season 4. So when Ladybug finally catches a glimpse of him, why was she not acting surprised at all? Like, oh, so that's what you look like. That's underwhelming. Nope, not a flinch, not a peep from her. While I know that's not really on topic, I just thought it was an interesting thing to bring up. Something else that I'd like to bring up is the fact that he shadow mothed the whole season. Now, I know that sounds like a given, but back in 2021, I thought it wasn't. When I first read the season 4 synopsis, I initially assumed that Gabriel was going to occasionally fuse the butterfly peacock miraculouses and then give it back to Natalie for the rest of the season. As in, I thought he was going to be Hawk Moth for like half the season and then Shadow Moth for the other half or something. But I was really, really wrong, wasn't I? But can you really blame me? After season 3, my expectations were just so low. I never thought they'd actually have the courage to commit to something so different. But they actually did. Gabriel becomes Shadow Moth and then stays that way until right at the end of the season. It's also really funny how Ladybug and Cat Noir, as soon as they found out that Hawk Moth changed his name to Shadow Moth, just instantly bought into it. They don't really question it all that much. They just go, okay, I guess he's called Shadow Moth now. Let's just call him Shadow Moth right off the bat. I mean, even in Heroes Day, way back in Season 2, everyone's calling him Scarlet Moth, but Ladybug and Cat Noir are the only ones still calling him Hawk Moth. And I thought that was really clever, because it showcases how Ladybug and Cat Noir don't respect Hawk Moth as a person. But... I guess they do now if they're calling him Shadow Moth. But that's neither here nor there, and I realise that I'm kind of rambling on things that don't really matter. Gabriel actually had some really good plans this season, and he actually grew a brain for once. He spent more than two seconds on each of his plans, and while he needed Natalie to come up with the best ones for him once again, he actually wasn't stupid all on his own this time. For example, Optigami, which I went on and on about in the Season 4 video. Or even Sentibubbler. These episodes had Gabriel trying new things, Things and actually be a competent villain for once in his life, which I can't say the same about for the other villains. <coughs> Chloe. If there's one thing I love in TV shows, it's the villain actually being a competent person. Somebody who actually knows what they're doing, knows what they want, and knows exactly how they can get what they want, and how quickly. That way when the heroes actually triumph against them, it feels earned. It doesn't feel like they were just handed a victory. So, yeah. That's pretty much everything I have to say about Gabriel in Season 4. It's not as flavorful as everything else in the previous seasons, but it's competent writing, so I applaud them for it. You could say that this section was very uncontroversial, which is something I cannot say for the next section. Gabriel's character really took a turn in season 5. It's like the writers realised that this was his final season and so sped around everything that they possibly could. He finally has some really, really good plans in this season and then actually speedruns absolutely everything he possibly can to get the Miraculouses. In season 4, he was really using his brain more, but in season 5, he's really using his brain. And I feel like that comes down to the fact that he has many more Miraculouses at his disposal, since Ladybug accidentally lost all of them at the end of Season 4. Gabriel transfers the powers of the Miraculouses to his alliance rings that he created with the help of Kagami's mother in order to transfer Miraculous powers to supervillains. It's a very refreshing take on something that we've seen done for years now, because now not only are they having to fight akumatized villains, but they're also going to have to take on the Miraculous powers that used to be on their side for seasons. However, I can't help but also wonder if any of 
if this is really all that necessary to begin with. We've seen in episodes like Volpina, Antibug, and Copycat that Akumatized villains can just have the powers of the Miraculous Holders without needing the essence of those Miraculouses to begin with. So basically, Gabriel's making life harder for himself without any reason. But that's not exactly why I called this segment the part where everything went wrong. The part where everything went wrong refers to Adrian and Gabriel's relationship throughout the season, and how inconsistent it feels. But before we get to that, let's talk about the good parts. Gabriel gets cataclysmed by Count Noir at the end of Destruction, and this leads to some very interesting plot points. Armed with the knowledge that he's only got a limited time left on this earth, he wants Adrian to remember him as a good father and so strives to be nicer to him. It's very heartwarming to see Gabriel finally loosen up around Adrian for once. However, it's hard to tell just how sincere he is, because it often feels like he's just putting on an act. I mean, listen to this voice clip in pretension. Do you see him in this kitchen? <laughs> No one in the world ever talks like that. And we really should save a nice pancake game because we're not gonna get it after like episode 10 or something. Towards the end of the season, Gabriel just instantly becomes worse than he's ever been before. Psychologically tormenting his son and getting really testy about he and Kagami being together for some reason. I mean, it literally has nothing to do with his plan to get the miraculouses of Ladybug and Cat Noir, so what gives writers? Why is he all of a sudden acting really awful to his son? His only son, his only son who he really cared about the well-being of in Garzilla and other episodes in season 2. But then in one episode he'll be hesitant to akumatize Adrian and in another he'll be more than willing to jump at the opportunity. What's with the inconsistency? It's like there are so many different writers writing his character arcs that they don't really know how to nail down any of his personality traits. Come to think of it, that's kind of been true for Gabriel for almost the entire show. I'm starting to realise that nothing about his character really makes any sense whatsoever. He flip-flops between being a very sympathetic antagonist and being a maniacal supervillain bent on destroying the world. It's almost like something like this happens in the writer's room every time they write a new episode. How do we write old mate Gabe this time around? And that's not even the worst part, because at the end of the season, even after everything that Gabriel has done across the show, he wins. He makes his wish, and then in the new world he creates, he's heralded as a hero. Oh, but it gets better. Way better, trust me. Apparently, Marinette lied to Adrian, saying that Monarch and Gabriel were actually not one and the same, and that Gabriel sacrificed his life to save everybody from Monarch. And Adrian says that he doesn't think he'll ever live up to his father as a hero, because his father is just so saintly. I don't know if I'll ever manage to be like him. So after all the garbage Gabriel puts Adrian through, Adrian doesn't even get the catharsis that comes with telling Gabriel how it really is. I mean, come on, Adrian doesn't even learn that his own father is monarch. Literally the only thing that this whole storyline seemed like it was leading up to. And he tells Marinette to make sure Adrian only remembers the good parts of their relationship, which I'll just say is pretty slim pickings. There's barely anything good for Adrian to even remotely remember, and even the good memories aren't worth the bad times that they shared. Gabriel has done some horrifically indescribable things in his lifetime. He maniacally laughs, makes really bad evil sounding puns, and really seems to pleasure in living that supervillain life. So why they tried to paint him as a heroic figure now, it just doesn't work, and he definitely did not earn this victory. You know, I hear a lot of people mentioning how it's really stupid and incomprehensible and hypocritical that Gabriel deserves a redemption arc, but Chloe's was thrown in the garbage. And those people are absolutely right, this is insane. Did the writers seriously not realise what they were doing by giving Gabe a redemption? Did not one of them think, hey, uh, Astra, maybe this is a bad idea actually? and maybe we're setting a truly terrible precedent for the future of our show and characters. <laughs> it's, it's honestly, honestly, it's messing with my mind just how idiotic this story decision was. And not one person saw it for that. Either they couldn't see the implications, or they could see them perfectly and just didn't care, and I honestly don't know which possibility is more disturbing. 
You know, I feel like this is a pretty easy fix, all things considered. Just don't redeem the guy. You can still have sympathetic moments in the finale, but just put him in prison or kill him off by the end of it. He should not have been rewarded for his evil behaviour. It would have been so cool to finally see Adrian stick it to the person who's been ruining his life, all his life. He's finally gonna get back at him, and yet this time never comes. What an absolute mess this season was. So many expectations, only for everything to crash and burn so demonstrably. There were so many opportunities to tell a great story, something that genuinely would have resonated with audiences. You built up a very loyal fan base for years and years, only to spit in their faces like this. It just wasn't necessary, and I don't even know what point they're trying to prove. But you know what? I'm not really going to try and explain the unexplainable. <laughs> Maybe it's just best to sigh and move on with our lives. Speaking of moving on. In conclusion, Gabriel Agreste is a complete mess of a character and of an antagonist. The dichotomy between his sympathetic motivation and evil, horrible actions make for a really confusing character. Not to mention the fact that for most of the show he's a complete idiot who puts faith in people who won't rely on him when they need him. He's also really overstayed his welcome by this point. It's very surprising how he was still the main villain even well into season 5. They dragged out his whole story across a disproportionately large stretch of time just to try and keep us invested for longer when actually the opposite effect happened. Because it's been so long without any significant character growth or development, people began to lose interest. And why shouldn't they have been? They shouldn't be forced to waste time on something that's just meandering around. And those of us who did take the time to stick around and see where the storyline would end weren't exactly thrilled. I can't believe it ended the way it did. Gabriel did not deserve to be absolved of all of his crimes. Imagine a final confrontation between Gabriel and Adrian, with Adrian finally standing up to his father and Gabriel finally facing his comeuppance for everything he's done over the show. But, of course, that's not what happened. I don't know why that's not what happened, but I guess none of us can never really understand what's going on in the writers' heads. Let's just hope season 6 and Lila as the new villain will actually have some good writing for a change. Because if not, this might just be the final nail in the coffin for a show that was already 6 feet under. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I know I promised two videos in March, so I was cutting it really close with this, wasn't I? I was really, really, really close now that I think about it. 31st of March, that's right at the end of the month. Sorry about that. This was a video that I was really looking forward to showing everybody, so I hoped you enjoyed. Also, around 4pm tomorrow, I'm going to be live streaming. I had a lot of fun with the last live stream, and it was really nice to see so many people turn up. Thank you all for that. I've decided to stream a little bit earlier tomorrow, so that some people in the other time zones where it's quite a few hours ahead will be able to turn up if they want to. Besides, I'm going to be busy in the evening, so I won't be able to do it at that usual time. So, I hope that this is beneficial for all of us. This has been a critical retrospective, and I'll see you all in the next video essay.